Lecture 4, In Search of Historical Troy. Now, did the Trojan War really happen? Is it history or just a story? If you ask that question at a university in 1850, whether at Harvard or one of the German universities, which were the leaders in 19th century study of classics, or at Oxford or Cambridge, your professor would have chuckled in his beard at your youthful naivete. Of course not, my boy. You might as well go looking for Arthur and uh, Camelot as go looking for Achilles and Troy and Agamemnon and Mycenae. No, no, it is just a story, a myth, a legend. No truth to it whatsoever. And that, after all, was what the best historian of the day, George Grote, an English businessman, a liberal member of parliament, a great believer in democracy, who what wrote what I think is still the best history of Greece. But when his book was published in 1856, he duly told the story of Troy, but said it is nothing but fiction. After all, not every myth has to have a historical kernel. It is our thesis in this course that some of the greatest myths have historical kernels. But many great myths do not. There's a whole genre of myths called creation myths that do not have a kernel of historical truth. Uh, one of the greatest myths of the uh, 20th century is Star Wars. I think that is a very noble story. I think it has a great theme and the constant struggle of good against evil. I believe it is presented in what for our day is noble enough language and it certainly, I believe, will speak across the ages. At least my students still respond to it well now even though it's a generation old. So not all great myths have a historical kernel. But does Troy? And in the same 1856, one of the most important Englishmen believed it did. We have mentioned Prime Minister Gladstone. He was certain that the Trojan War was real history, and if you could just find the right person, they could discover Troy. After all, the Greeks and Romans believed that the Trojan War was real. There was a city called Ilium in the Roman empire that sat atop the very spot where the Greeks and Romans thought Troy had once been. And if the 19th century professors had looked a little more carefully at Thucydides, the Athenian historian of the 5th century BC, and who was regarded in the 19th century as the first scientific historian, they would have seen that this most skeptical of historians, Thucydides, took Homer absolutely at his word, using the very number of ships described by Homer, using the Trojan War as a real historical event to document his thesis, relevant to us today, that a global economy, greater technology, economic growth does not lead to peace but to ever larger wars. So Thucydides thought the Trojan War was a real historical event. Another very, very sharp-eyed gentleman, Heinrich Schliemann, believed it was a real historical event. But of course, he would receive no attention at Harvard or Yale or Cambridge or Oxford. After all, he wasn't a PhD, he wasn't a scholar. He was a businessman, an entrepreneur, and in fact, that's what he was. He was an intellectual entrepreneur as well as a business entrepreneur. And it became his life's work to show that the scholars were wrong, that Troy truly existed, and that Hector and Agamemnon were real figures of history. His life did not begin in a promising fashion. He was born in 1822 in what was then Prussia, in the eastern part of Germany. His father was a Lutheran pastor, 
and the pastor had some issues with his congregation. Uh, he had an affair with the maid. He embezzled church funds uh, and was finally driven out of his post and couldn't find another one. But he loved his little boy Heinrich. And Heinrich would sit on his father's knee and his father would read to him from a book he ultimately gave to Heinrich, a universal history, a world history. And Heinrich would ask his father again and again, oh, please read the story of Troy. And the story of Troy was illustrated by a wonderful engraving showing um, Aeneas carrying his father out of the burning ruins of Troy. And Heinrich said to his father, I'm going to one day discover Troy. And his father said, oh, that's a noble ambition, but as I well remember from, from my theological training and courses in history, Troy never existed. Well, I believe it did, Father, and I'm going to find it someday. Well, it's a wonderful idea. But his father fell short of funds and had to give Heinrich over to an uncle to take care of him. And one day when Heinrich was 14, all expecting to go to the classical gymnasium and learn Greek and Latin and be able to read Homer in the original. His uncle came to him and said, too bad, old chap, but uh, I can, cannot afford to send you to university. You're going to have to go to work as a clerk in a grocery store. And in fact, you can't even start off as a clerk. You've got to start off as somebody who uh, loads the shelves. And so there he was, loading great cartons of potatoes herring pickled in brine in big barrels, also large barrels of potato, whiskey, vodka, there in the eastern part of Germany. Working late one night, despairing of his life, a mill hand came in, a, someone who worked in a lumber yard, and said, can I have a drink of vodka? And Heinrich said, much as I'd like to oblige you, you have already run up too large of a bill, so no, no thank you. So they celebrated the funeral rites of Hector, breaker of horses. Wait a minute, said Heinrich. What did you just say? Just what I said. Yeah, but what does that mean? Is that Greek? Yes, it's from the Iliad. It means thus they celebrated the funeral rites of Hector, breaker of horses. And I'm going to die if you don't give me a drink. Here, I'll give you a drink. Do you know any more Greek? Why, I can quote you a hundred lines from the Iliad. Do it, and I'll buy you as many drinks as you want. So after a hundred lines, the um, uh, fairly well lubricated by this time mill hand was about to pass out, and Heinrich said, wait a minute, wh where did you learn that? Oh, you know, I was a classics major in college, and I can't get a job. I have to work in a lumberyard. Take my advice, boy, and <gasps> become an accountant, as he had passed. Well, that's not a bad idea. I've got to make some money because only if I have money can I get a university education and can I one day find Troy. So he set his heart on a dream. That's what we must all do. Find a dream that is worthy of us and pursue it. Heinrich went off to find his fortune in America. Uh, signed on as a deckhand, and the ship almost immediately ran into high seas. He was nearly drowned, washed up on the shore in Holland. Now, you might take that as a sign that you should go back and be a clerk in a grocery store, not, not Heinrich Schliemann. He went to Amsterdam, walked from place to place to place in accounting houses, and said, I want to be an accountant. Well, have you had accounting courses? No, but I have learned on my own how to do accounting. No, no, you need a certificate. But one, one uh, accounting house, the owner took a notice of Heinrich and said, you really will work hard, won't you? Yes, I will. I'll work as hard as you want me to. All right, we'll give you a try. Well, he does a superb job. But much of this firm's business was done with Russia. And nobody in the firm knew Russian. And the boss was constantly walking up and down and said, I know those Russians are cheating us, but I can't find a way to uncover it. And Heinrich said, well, I know Russian. How do you know Russian? I just learned it. And so one of the Russian customers came in, and sure enough, Heinrich could talk to him very well and did a very good job of showing that perhaps everything the Russian was saying about business wasn't quite true. So the owner said, I'm going to send you to Russia, and there I want you to take care of our business. He did. 
And Heinrich very faithfully carried out his duties to the accounting house, but also began to speculate in what we would call commodities today. And by this time, 1856, it was the Crimean War. And prices for certain commodities went sky high. And Heinrich was a master of judging the market. And he got very, very wealthy very, very fast. Uh, by this time, he had married to a Russian woman. Uh, and by this time, was also wealthy enough that he thought he could indulge his lifelong dream. Well, his Russian wife had no interest whatsoever in learning Greek or going in search of Troy. She was just a millstone around his neck. But they had children, and they'd been married in a Russian Orthodox ceremony, and there was no divorce possible. So again, not allowing the fates to beat him down, Heinrich got aboard the ship and went to the United States. It was probably his second trip to the United States. He had gone to bury his brother. His brother had gone to California during the gold rush and uh, died there of a fever, and Heinrich had gone to bury him and also got involved in the gold uh, market there, the gold commodities, and was nearly lynched by one of his partners, but escaped with a good sum of gold as well. So this was his second trip to America. And he went immediately to New York, and they said, well, uh, you're from Russia. Yes, but I'm an American citizen. You are? Yes, I was in California when it was made a state of the Union, so that automatically makes me a citizen. Oh, okay, well, I guess people didn't check records that closely then. They said, all right, you're a uh, citizen of the United States. However, uh, New York has a very long residence requirement before you can get a divorce. All right, tell me this. What place in the United States, what state has the easiest divorce laws? Uh, Indiana. Off he went to Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana. Went into the first law office he found and said, I want to get a divorce from my wife in Russia. Well, you will have to have lived here at least six months. I see, okay. Came back the next day with six people who swore he had lived there for more than six months. Got his divorce. So he was free of that Russian woman. What he wanted to do now was to marry a Greek so that he could spend all of his time reading and writing and speaking in this magnificent language that was the language of Homer. He wrote to the Archbishop of uh, Athens uh, requesting his help in finding a suitable uh, young lady, and the archbishop had just the person in mind, and Schliemann went to Athens, met her, and immediately gave her five lines from the Iliad, and Sophie gave him five more back. He gave her five, Sophie gave, her, uh, gave him five more back, and there they were, soulmates for the rest of their lives. And he shared his dream with her of going to excavate Troy, and she was absolutely enthusiastic and wanted to go along and be part of the team, as she was for the rest of his life. Trouble was that Troy was located, at least the site that Schliemann thought was Troy, and what the Greeks and Romans had thought was Troy, was located in, the, in Turkey under the government of the Ottomans in those days. A very corrupt government with absolutely no interest in Greek and Roman antiquities. They had no relevance to Turks unless you could sell them. Uh, thus, it was very hard to get a permit, what the Turks called a firman, a permit to excavate. And the more eager Schliemann wanted it, seemed to be to excavate, the less inclined the Turks were. So it took a lot of his fortune to bribe them. But he did. And in 1870, he began his excavation at Troy. He was working at the very beginning of archaeology. There were not chairs of archaeology. There were not journals of archaeology. All that had really been done was almost like um, grave robbing. Say, in England, there would be a tumulus, say, barrow, and someone would dig down in it and see if they found gold. But scientific archaeology did not exist. And Heinrich Schliemann, partly through trial and error, and partly by making use of experts that he would work with, like architects and engineers, developed scientific archaeology. Huge gangs of workmen. Schliemann made the assumption that they should plow right down to the first layer they found. 
leaving everything that they came upon in the meantime until they got to the very bottom out of the way. And that earliest level would be the Troy of Homer. Well, it wasn't so, and, uh, but he found walls, and he found the first level of what would ultimately be called the first city of Troy. In other words, he found a city where Troy was supposed to be. And in 1873, on May the 27th, he would describe how early that morning he and Sophie had gone out to the excavation and he had seen something glimmering. And he jumped down into the trench with Sophie and behind the glimmer, which seemed to be copper, there seemed to be more that might even be gold. Thus he immediately announced a holiday. And the workmen all left, not quite sure what holiday it was, but they left. And Sophie, Schliemann described, put the gold of Troy in her shawl and carried it back to their house. And there lay before him what he called the gold of Priam, the gold of the king of Troy in the time of the Trojan War. A magnificent set of gold rings, bracelets, and a set of golden beads that made a glorious diadem that Sophie was photographed wearing. So here was, to the world, the real truth that Troy was, as Homer said, rich in gold. He had not found Homer's Troy. That would lay a number of levels up, be called ultimately Troy 7. But he had found a city at Troy and gold, gold that we now know comes from around 2000 BC, not the 1250 BC. But Homer had known, as the Greeks had known, that Troy was for a long time a mighty and powerful and wealthy city. He smuggled the gold out. The Turks by this time were very, very upset with him. But he had found Troy. And if he had found Troy, then there must also be a Mycenae. And indeed, the Greeks had known that there was a town called Mycenae. It was still in the 19th century, surrounded by great walls called Cyclopean walls, walls built by Cyclops. But in the classical period, it had been a very small city. It sent a few hundred men to the great battle at Plataea, for example. And there was no way, the scientific scholarly world said, that this little city, Mycenae, could have been the gold, powerful city, the golden, powerful city of Homer. Well, how do you find out? You go and excavate. So making use of, again, very liberal amounts of bribes, he began to excavate at Mycenae. But the Greeks had learned from the experience of the Turks. They were not going to have any gold uh, stolen from them, and he was given a very good scientific uh, advisor to watch every move he made. And under that supervision, in 1876, digging with inside these Cyclopean walls of Mycenae, Schliemann came upon a huge well, a shaft. And going down to the bottom of that well, under constant supervision, he found more gold. Magnificent golden death mask of kings, along with their spears and their shields, their greaves. But these golden masks, finely beaten out. And he telegraphed that day to the king of the Hellenes, Today I looked upon the face of your ancestors. He was now a celebrity. And the first important person to recognize Schliemann, to bring him and have him give lectures, was Prime Minister Gladstone. And at the British Museum, Schliemann described his finds. And there it was for the world. Troy really existed. Mycenae really existed. Now, Schliemann learned, improved himself, uh, employed a very fine architect, Wilhelm Durpfeldt, 
went back with more bribes to Troy and began to understand that the level where he had found this first gold was too early. And by the end of his life, it understood that the upper level was the, st the city that had been found and described by, by Homer. He also came to understand that the golden masks that he had found at Mycenae were earlier than the time of Homer. But again, these cities had long been powerful and famous. And there seemed to be no disputing the fact that Schliemann had uncovered a whole new world, a world of Bronze Age archaeology, where just as all the weapons and shields and helmets in Homer are made of bronze, so bronze was the major metal of this heroic age. And the Troy that he ultimately realized was the Troy of Homer was indeed sometime around 1250 besieged, captured, and burned. And it is most important to realize that the archaeologists who have followed Schliemann, whether digging at Troy or digging at Mycenae, have all given the strongest testimony to his accuracy, to his willingness to learn, and to his truthfulness. The archaeologist from the University of Cincinnati, Carl Blagan, from 1932 to 38, carefully excavated at Troy, giving us firm dates based on the pottery. Uh, archaeologists like uh, Professor Milonus from the Washington University in St. Louis, excavating on the Acropolis at Mycenae in 1952, under the strictest conditions, found another shaft grave, even earlier than the grave found, founded by, uh, found by uh, Schliemann, with again another mask of gold and silver. So Schliemann found a whole new science, archaeology, and established forever that the Trojan War was real. There were people who tried to deny this. He was particularly attacked by a museum curator, Bertiker, Carl Bertiker, who f insisted that this was not a palace and a fortress, but was rather some huge graveyard. But Schliemann by this time had developed very important friends in Germany, including Bismarck, including the Kaiser, a famous scientist, and they begged him to please give the gold that he had found at Troy, the gold of Priam, the treasure of Priam, to Germany. And in 1880, because Schliemann remained at what would be called a sharp trader, he always got more than he gave away. And he got what he wanted. He got honorary citizenship of Berlin and the highest accolades from the German government. His treasure of Troy was given to Berlin, put in the museum of uh, prehistory, and a whole new wing was built for it. In 1890, he went back to Germany. He was having constant trouble with his ears. Uh, Professor Verschau was his close friend, and uh, he was urged to have an operation on his ears. It wasn't successful, but he wanted to go back to Athens hoped to be there by Christmas of 1890, but didn't make it that far. He was in Naples, too ill to travel, still managed to go out and look at the remains of Pompeii, but on Christmas morning, walking the streets of Naples, he fell over and died. He had no wallet on him, but it was clear from his clothes that he was a wealthy man, and uh, was soon discovered that this was indeed the most famous, famous archaeologist of his day, Heinrich Schliemann. But the story doesn't end there. The treasure of Priam was in the museum in Berlin. It was the glory of the Museum of Prehistory down until 1939. Then came that terrible war, and the Germans ruthlessly ransacked Europe, carrying away paintings, archaeological objects, 
vases, all manner of magnificent artworks. Some of them were taken by Hermann Goering and used to outfit his palaces. Heinrich Himmler took his share. Others were just taken to adorn the museum of the museums of Germany after Germany had conquered Europe. And in retaliation, Germany would later be ransacked. It began with the terrible bombing of Germany. And already by 1940, Berlin had received some bombings. Therefore, major works of art were taken and stored, sometimes in salt mines, sometimes in tunnels, but always under very good conditions to, uh, of humidity and temperature. And then by 1942, the bombing of Berlin had become ever more devastating. The curator of the Museum of uh, Prehistory was Wilhelm Unterzacht. He became extremely worried about his collections and above all, the gold of Troy. Thus he arranged by 1944 to have them put in the very basement of one of the huge anti-aircraft towers that had been built in the Berlin Zoo. And he even slept there in the anti-aircraft shelter to make certain nothing happened to these precious objects, which were stored in three large containers. Finally, Berlin fell. And on May the 8th, the Russians began to ransack Berlin, and they also came to the aircraft shelter, the anti-aircraft shelter. And uh, Unverzak told them what this was, that this was the gold of Troy. And he told the com uh, commanding general, and he said, I would rather you take it and carry it off than allow it to be plundered, because that's what's happening with all of these other works of art. Ordinary soldiers are just ransacking places. I want these kept preserved. And the commanding general was wise enough to understand this. And so they were shipped on an airplane alongside a bunch of stolen fur coats back to Moscow. And there they were put in the basement of the Pushkin Museum. And the curator knew what these were. They were clearly marked the Troy Gold. But for years, not a word from the Soviet Union. We know nothing whatsoever of any gold of Troy. And the scholarly world had to assume that this gold was lost forever. It was in that absence of information that dreadful stories began to be told about Schliemann. The professors had never gotten over the fact that he had been right and they were wrong. So a whole galaxy of professors who had never done archaeology, never worked at Troy, for example, began to say that Schliemann was a pathological liar, that the gold of Troy had all been faked, made in Paris. This reached its height about 1990. Then the Soviet Union collapsed, archives became available, and two Russian art historians, Akinsha and Koslov, Konstantin Akinsha and Gregory Kozlov began to hunt the trail. And they found in the archives the records that showed the arrival in Moscow of the treasure of Priam and how it had been examined and where it was now still in the basement. 1993, the curator of the Pushkin Museum made the grand announcement, to our complete surprise, we have found the artifacts from Troy. Kozlov, who was a curator, told the press they've been there all along. He was immediately fired as being a traitor to Russia. But there they were, and since that time, the Pushkin Museum has done a superb job. A magnificent display was arranged, an exhibition, the artifacts have been examined by leading archaeologists and pronounced to be authentic. Gold objects from 2000 BC were the ancestors to the gold of Homer's Troy. The Germans have asked for them back. The Soviets keep saying no. 
And as I talk, they are still there in the Pushkin Museum. And what? What do we learn? Troy was real. Real history with real historical lessons to teach us. But I'm going to tell you there's a higher truth. Follow your dreams. Never let anybody dissuade you from what you know to be your life's mission. And blessed will you be if you find that life's mission and follow it wherever it leads you.